Well, it's been another busy week in the pandemic world. California, where I live, had to roll back its opening plans as the number of new cases starts to rise. Only a few weeks after the Memorial Day weekend kickoff, as a matter of fact. The state's trying to figure out how to get a school year going in this context, coming up with ideas for a hybrid education process that has kids sitting in a classroom part of the time. A challenge that'll be hard to meet when you have schools like our local high school with several thousand students on a 50-acre campus. Now is the time where we need the best people who can figure out the best answers, and it's hard to see it in the early results. What are the biggest challenges you're facing during these interesting times? It's been almost five months since I've been able to see my dad, 87-year-old man who's locked away in assisted living, socially distanced from even most of the other residents. We have to try and stay optimistic. I'm sure we'll figure out a way to get some steady state, but it's going to take all of us to play nice with each other, even for a little while. But now more than ever, I think we can all use a relief valve. My guest today is Nina Levinson. Nina is a graduate student at Middlebury Institute of International Studies, where she's been studying translation localization management in Japanese. She previously graduated last year from a university in Tokyo, Japan, with a BA in Japanese to English Interpretation and Translation. There, she worked as a freelance simultaneous conference interpreter and a research assistant working on revitalization methods for indigenous languages. She's currently set to begin an internship in visual effects localization at LAI Global Game Services this summer. Hi, Nina. Thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you've been doing. So, yeah, so I go to the Middlebury Institute of International Studies up in Monterey Bay, California. Um, My major is translation localization management, uh, and my language pair is Japanese and English. So basically what that means is I study translation, uh, localization, which is sort of the transcreation of languages um, from one to the other, and then management. So how to basically manage translation and localization projects in a greater spanning company, and then focusing specifically on Japanese. Okay. I know Monterey Bay is where um, the U.S. Armed Forces and the State Department send people to learn languages. Is that part of the same thing, or are they their own entity? So there are a bunch of different naval bases up around that area. They have um, the Defense Language Institute, which is specifically a naval graduate school. But for all intents and purposes, we're pretty much separate institutions. So, yeah, our school is not really um, connected to the Army in any way. How long have you been at Middlebury? So I've been attending for one full year, and then I have one more year until I receive my M.A., Tell me about your uh, your experiences in Tokyo as well. Oh, yeah. So I attended uh, my university for three years in Tokyo, Japan. I went to Kokusai Kiristo Kyo Daigaku. And um, that's basically kind of up in the north of Tokyo, sort of in the forest areas. Um, and there I majored in translation and interpretation into Japanese and English. Was that, was that a four-year program? Yeah, so I, I transferred. I originally, out of high school, got into Cal State LA, and maybe one month into it, I realized it was not the right fit at all. Um, so I started working on transferring everything, um, and I knew that at that point, I knew I really wanted to be an interpreter. I also knew that the only way to really actualize that dream was to go to Japan and really get focused on Japanese and especially take interpreting and translation classes. Um, and the school that I went to ended up being the best one for that. Did you have a natural affinity towards Japanese? Why did that become your language of choice? I think I've always had a natural affinity for language. I just think that Japanese just happened to be the one that it was. Um, you know, I was maybe 11, 12 years old, and I was really interested in anime and manga like kids are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got super into it, and I liked listening to it and then mimicking it and seeing if I couldn't, like, understand the words or create sentences. And I just kind of at that point realized that I just really liked language. It didn't matter if it was Japanese or not. I just really liked language, you know, but that was what I was into. 
and so I kind of went to my parents and asked if I could go to a Japanese like school or take lessons somehow. And I had a friend at the time who was Japanese and her mom had immigrated from Kyoto to America. And they lived in an area, uh, Gardena, which has a really big Japanese population and consequently a lot of Japanese uh, language schools that meet on Saturdays. So I ended up going to one of those and I, I went for six years until I graduated high school. So you're native of Southern California? Yes. What was it like to jump into culture in Japan and, and just kind of, what was it like making the adaption? Um, it was interesting because I had been traveling to Japan for a couple of years before I actually went there for university. But at that time, I was really more of a tourist and I was just kind of going around by myself. But when I went to university, I think I had a lot of misconceptions that the university would be not 100% similar to an American one, but in the ways that you would think like they would have um, very good communication suit, uh, services with the students and their websites would be up to date and they would be able to email you when there was an issue with your status or, you know, something was going on, like you had an interview or something like that. Uh, and they were not. And that was a huge shock to me that everything in Japan actually, despite it being having this image of being very technological giant that it is, um, they are very much still working kind of like they're in the 80s. They still send fax all the time. They oh. still send everything by mail. If you're a university student and you live on campus, doesn't matter. You still get sent everything by mail. Um, even That's if interesting. Even if it was something very, very important, like your tuition payments didn't go through and now we're threatening to deport you. Completely things like that that you wouldn't think. But So I think that was where my misconceptions really happened. Being in the tech side of the world, I know a lot of people who do a lot of traveling in Asia. It kind of feels like, and this is my perspective, which is totally Eurocentric. I've traveled to Europe. I've never traveled to Asia. You either fall in love with that place and you want to spend more time there, or you kind of don't and you want to come back to something that's maybe more familiar. What was your experience like with that? Uh, every country is going to be different and everywhere is going to have different um, things that either match or don't match with my ideals. I've met a lot of people actually more more than myself that um, have been to Japan, have lived in Japan, love it, would want to move back in a heartbeat. And they experience all the same things that I experienced there, yet they still want to go back and live there. I think maybe I'm a little bit too strong willed. <laughs> and um, when I uh, encounter either racism or sexism, I get really, really angry about it. And I want to fight about it. And I can't just kind of sit back and say, Oh, well, that's the way things are here. And mm. it's the way it is. And, and you know, I, I don't accept it. Personally, too, I ended up facing a lot more than any of the people I've ever spoken to about. Um, you know, I was I was sexually harassed and assaulted so many times when I was there. And it really made me have uh, a huge distrust for um, just the men in the culture. And you know, really having to constantly look at myself and focus, like hyper focus on what I was doing and how I was behaving and what I was looking like in that moment, because everyone would constantly be staring at me um, just because I look different. And that was a huge issue. So I think when it comes to Japan, when people romanticize it, I think they're romanticizing it because they have either traveled there a couple of times and they want to travel there. And I think for that purpose, traveling in Japan is a great idea. You'll love it. You're going to have an amazing time. It's going to be awesome. Um, when it comes to trying to insert yourself into the society or having a life there for yourself, um, I, I don't recommend it, I think. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry you had to have all those experiences. It's okay. I think it's hard. It's, it's going to be extremely difficult, especially for a woman. Yeah. You were up in Monterey for uh, the last year? Yeah, yeah. So I've been back for officially like one year now. I'm just so happy to be back, honestly. Um, when I when I left, it was such a relief that there were so many things and people and experiences that I knew I didn't have to have again. And that I knew that the next time I come back, I would be coming back on my own terms. And, you know, I could kind of, I wouldn't be locked into uh, the pressures of my university and whatever um, job I was working at the time. And if I come back, I can come back on my terms and be free with it. And I was really happy 
So you were up in the Bay Area around the time when uh, COVID uh, mm. came wandering into our lives, huh? Yes. Um, the, they took action up there pretty quickly and they locked things down right away. Were you caught up in a lockdown up in Monterey? Um, so Monterey kind of is a little bit south, so we didn't get quite in there. Um, I remember my experience being <laughs> very um, ironic where I came home one night after going out with some people and I came to um, my roommate was like, oh, how was it? And I was like, oh, it was fine. Um, there was like a lot less people than normal. Um, and he's like, well, I'm not surprised. You know, it's coronavirus and like everybody's scared and everybody wants to go on lockdown now. And I'm like, why do you have to make everything about coronavirus? Everything is no. always about coronavirus. You always talk about it. Just stop talking about it. Not everybody is thinking about coronavirus right now. Just stop. And then um, maybe like two days later, they sent out a mass email at my school during lunchtime when everyone was in the cafeteria that they were going to be locking down the school for the rest of the semester. For me, I'm a, a little bit of a news junkie. So I was watching um, when the first outbreak started up in Washington State. I was thinking to myself, okay, how are we going to respond to it? And really, do we know how, how bad it is, right? One of the things that I found frustrating about all of this is because we, because we basically screwed the pooch on, the, uh, on our national response to it, we, we don't really know the real numbers, right? We don't have the statistics that say 50% of the American population is going to be infected and of that, 85% will not have any kind of symptoms at all and... 20% are going to wind up sick, 10% are going to be in the hospital, and 5% of those are going to die. Right? And because we don't have that, it's almost impossible to calculate risk so that you can go back out into the world again. That's been the part that's been the most frustrating to me. I want to be able to go back out in the world again. And without the statistics, we're not going to be able to get things opened up again. When, when you got the lockdown, what did you do? Did school close at that point and it was, okay, everybody go home and lock down with your families? Was it no shelter in place where you are? What was it like? Well, we kind of got this email that said, you know, um, the school is going to be closing indefinitely because of coronavirus. Um, and I think it happened about a day after um, the school, like kind of a couple miles from a CSU Monterey Bay mm -hmm. also shut down. Um, and so they said it to us on actually the day right before spring break was supposed to start. So I think that was the timing. That was their plan. Okay. Um, and it was interesting to just see it happening in real time because we were all sitting at lunch just talking and, and, you know, doing work and whatever. And suddenly someone looks up and goes, do you guys get this email? And I'm like, hmm? and everybody starts checking. Oh, my God, did you get the email? And you hear it over there. And like somebody else goes like, did you get the email? And then you hear it over there at like a different table and like, you know, e -meru mite nai no. and like <laughs> you, it's just like, you'll just hear it in different languages all over the entire um, campus because it's like, oh, well, it's an interpreter school. What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, so you hear it on in all different languages, certainly like surrounding um, the cafeteria. And then finally, someone like mentions it to the um, cafeteria, like staff, like they're not students. They're just staff that, you know, work there and they look horrified yeah they're like oh what what about our jobs yeah. what you know yeah. um so that was terrifying and it was it was scary to see it kind of fan out um and at the same time my parents were supposed to come get me the like that day to go we were gonna go for like spring break basically we we're gonna spend like a couple of days in cambria and then go down to la and hang out and then a week later i'm supposed to come back and I, you know, called them and said like, oh, well, it's on hiatus now. We don't know if our school's going to come back. They said it might be two weeks, uh, but then they'll come back or maybe the rest of the semester. We just don't know anymore. Um, so I ended up packing my bag for like maybe two weeks of being home. And um, yeah, and then, I, and then I never came back. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you have to basically go back up and move out? Yeah, so my situation was um, got a little bit more difficult. As time went on, um, so eventually I finished the semester online and I went back for a couple of, you know, some clothes and some whatever things I needed. And um, then after that, my dad's health uh, deteriorated very quickly. Um, he's had cancer for a very long time. Um, not because of really coronavirus had anything to do with it. It's just that like it's, yeah. you know, his disease is progressing and it's become very difficult. Um, and so it's gotten to the point where we're not really sure how much time is left. Um, 
And so they're kind of saying like, well, it could be six months. It could be a couple more. Uh, not really sure. Um, so it kind of got into being like, oh, I really need to stay home. Like it would probably be better if I stayed home for the next semester. And then um, consequently enough, our school, you know, all of this happened mm -hmm. with the um, the second surge. Yeah. Uh, and our school was like, nope, we're online for the next semester. And maybe also after that. We don't know. But probably, but for sure, for sure, on fall, we're completely online, which really works out for me and was such a relief. Um, and so now I'm finally um, going to be moving my stuff out in a couple of weeks and I'm done and I get to at least save some money on rent. So, yeah. Okay. What have you been uh, doing since you've been home? A lot of just hanging out. <laughs> um, I was I was in school and that was most of my time. And then now I'm out of school and I'm kind of waiting for my internship to start up. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just playing a lot of video games and um, so to, reading comic books. <laughs> to talk about your internship. Oh, so um, I have an internship at uh, LAI which is a um, company run in Silicon Valley. And they mostly do uh, localization for game software. Okay. Um, so it can be things like, for example, getting um, documents from a company that's creating a new video game console. And they need to create a bunch of documents to send out to video game creators or how to make a video game for this console. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all in Japanese. Oh, well, we should, you know translate that and localize it into English and whatever other languages we want to have it in, um, whatever our client is requiring us to do. Um, so that's part of it. And then it can also be um, a lot of visual effects, mm -hmm. which goes into like subtitling or dubbing yep. or even um, localizing text on screen. Um, and so mostly focus on that. Okay. Is this uh, remote work for you? You're going to do it from down here? Yeah, 100% remote. Don't feel yeah. bad. Everybody in the visual effects industry right now is 100% remote. The, the entertainment industry literally flipped a switch and shut itself off in, inside of two weeks. Yeah. Um, I worked for a company called Deluxe Entertainment Services for a while. And one of our key products that we provided was localization for films going out on um, video release and theatrical release. So we would do things like the uh, the, the translations of the uh, the subtitling that would go out with a movie, things like that. It's interesting to watch the work and what's involved in it. Yeah, it's, it's one of the most um, lucrative industries right now, actually. Yeah. It's increasing so dramatically. So we're really happy for it, at least at our university, that... As bad as it is right now, we can come out and hopefully have some opportunities and some jobs. Yeah. yeah well, one of the one yeah. of the the industries that we produce the most product for international export in is culture and entertainment. So it makes perfect sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. How have you been dealing with uh, the whole social distancing thing? I imagine it's got an even heavier weight, seeing as your dad's not well. Yeah, it's um it's really really difficult I think for me. I had um a really really rough go of it when it first happened and we were online. And of course like they jump us onto online learning and none of the professors are prepared for mm -hmm. it and none of the students have ever really done it too much at, you know up to that point. Yeah. Um at my old university in Japan, obviously they were very um not technologically capable at all. So there was zero online learning and there was zero opportunity to take an online course. Yeah. Um, and at this university, uh, we had a few. And so I was able to do one sort of leading up to it. And that was okay. Um, but having everything be online is a huge issue. And one of the most important factors of it was not having um, my classmates around me because the biggest part of um, our work is that we will meet after class every day and we'll work on things. And we're working seven days a week, obviously, because grad school never stops. Right. Um, and I would see these people maybe five to six days a week um, and be spending multiple hours with them talking. And, you know, we kind of re rely on each other to understand the material because it's really sort of taught at you. And then it's up to you to figure it out on your own. And, you know, not everybody gets everything at once. Yeah. Um, so we would always rely on each other for that. And it was 
so impossible to do it by myself. Um, and that was my biggest struggle. Has anything taken its place? Are you doing video conferencing? Are you doing any of that kind of stuff in its place? Well, the way they set it up was um, they would have a teachers teach us at like the time that the class normally would be held. Um, and then we would do it and then kind of go off. But um, because of that, yeah, but everybody is still sort of dealing with all of it in their own way. So a lot of people kind of became very distant and, um, you know, couldn't find the time to really message back or talk about it as much. Um, and we tried to do some like meetings in the beginning, but it just got really difficult for everyone. And we would always be tired. I was constantly just tired yeah. all day, every day. Um, and we just couldn't really work up to, you know, meeting on the right schedule. And then towards the end, my dad got really sick. And so I've been like, you know, fully taking care of him while my mom goes to work. Yeah. Um, Cause she actually, works at the hospital right now. Oh. Um, she works at uh, Torrance Memorial. She's an x-ray tech. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Well, so that's got to add a whole different dimension to your life. What's What's it been like having her come and go from a place that, you know, there's so much of a higher potential risk? I mean, we try not to think about it. Um, I try to just not really keep that too much in mind. She gets tested. Uh, she's been tested before. She was negative. Um, the scary part, really, what was terrifying, um, was in the very beginning, maybe a couple of weeks into being on lockdown, um, probably March or April, uh, she got a call from her boss, which said, well, because she was taking, um, chemotherapy drugs at the time, uh, they were like saying, oh, well, because you're like high risk of, you know, getting, um, COVID because you're on chemotherapy, then we shouldn't have you be working in the ER with the COVID patients, obviously. Right. Um, so we're going to just uh, send you home and don't come back tomorrow. Didn't say anything about paid leave. Are you fired? Or is it unpaid leave? What's happening? Where do you work now? Just said, um, you're not fired, but don't, you know, like not even that really. Just don't come back. Yeah. Um, and it took maybe two weeks of calling around to the supervisors and all the people running every single, um, you know, x-ray uh, stations in within the Torrance network to figure out what the heck was going on. Um, and finally, they were like, oh, wait, so like you can't work with like COVID patients, but like maybe you could work with like non-COVID patients, uh -huh. which seems like such a simple yeah. <laughs> concept. Yeah. It doesn't really seem very difficult to get. Um, so eventually they were able to put her in a, um, outpatient center where she was just working with people coming in for, you know, scheduled x-rays. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's much, much better. So uh, a lot of your life, um, focuses around communication between people. It, we're living in a world mm -hmm. now where we've had to come up with new ways to communicate with each other at a distance. Do you have any interesting, maybe observations about what it's like when people are communicating back and forth, whether it's by video conferencing or even with a mask on, my, my wife is hard of hearing. And so she often relies on lip reading to help her supplement information that coming from somebody else. So she understands what's going on. And pretty much that's gone when, when everyone around you is wearing yeah. a face mask. So as somebody who, when you're communicating between languages, there's a lot of, there, there have to be a lot of nonverbal cues that go along as well. How has all of the new ways we communicate with each other kind of played into that or affected that? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. And it's, it's so terrible of me that I didn't think about how hard of hearing and deaf people are faring with this until right now. Um, yeah. That you can't lip read. So how do you really communicate if the other person can't sign? Yeah. I've seen, I've, you know, I've, I've seen, I've gone into a store where there was a, an older woman who needed to, to lip read and they would separate themselves, you know, the, the clerk and the person would separate themselves as much as they could and then pull the masks down so they could talk. So I've seen, I've seen people try to accommodate for it, but it's one of those things that you just, you really can't. And, and the disability angle on this is it, it's from being able to communicate because you need to lip read to being able to keep a mask on your head while you have hearing aids is even a challenge, right? We've, we've experienced yeah. all these kind of things. But for somebody who focuses on language, what has it been like having these conversations on Zoom instead of face-to-face? -face? Um, well, it's it's been 
okay for the most part. I mean, um, my professors that are a bit younger, like 40s, 30s, um, and are American have no problem teaching on Zoom. They're kind of just fine with it. Um, but my Japanese professors, ooh, uh, they struggle. Um, they struggle hard. And it's, I think, because, yeah, you're from Japan and they don't really do this sort of Zoom meeting thing. And I really do wonder how Japanese companies have fared in all of this um, with the online aspect of it because they, more so than us, are the least equipped um, to handle it. And uh, I don't really know because I'm not um, contacting with anybody who's working at one of those companies right now, but um, it would be interesting to find out. Um, yeah, with our older Japanese professors, you know, one, it's kind of the age thing. They're in their 60s or 70s, and they're just not really sure about it. They don't really trust it. They just don't know how to, you know, use the computers very well. Um, and then it's another part of that. They really won't adapt their um like lesson plans at all okay and sometimes it's okay but sometimes it's really not like uh i have friends who have one professor who was teaching like um sort of like literature and uh doing lectures and what he wanted was to have it be sort of like a um debate class uh where you're all gonna sit and read your um whatever you've written and then we're going to debate about it and have this back and forth but it's really not well equipped for that because it's sort of like you have to have everybody talking at once everybody's mic has to work everyone's computer has to work with their camera yeah. uh it just gets kind of too out of hand too quickly um and no matter what he would not try to change things even if the students would say hey this would be a better way to do it or not um and that was a lot of our uh teachers mainly just very simple things like learning how to put yourself on mute. Yeah. So <laughs> while I'm taking my translation final, I don't have to listen to your breathing while I'm trying to, you know, not fail your class. It's, you know, it's, it, that's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's funny. We live in a world where some people get technology and some people don't. And of course the younger you are, the more you get it because you've been living with it your entire life. Isn't, um, uh, pride a very important part of Japanese culture in a way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But it's it's more of an issue with men than it yeah. is with women. Um, with our translation professors, both of them are female, um, so they're kind of more open to it. Yeah, they're like, please help me. They'll the you know they know when to ask for help, which is good. And and if they are doing something like they're not talking or they're on mute or something, like we can just shoot in there and help them. Um, for a male professor, it's a whole different situation. Yeah, you have to be very, you have to act completely different. Okay. So what do you do to help you blow off the stress from day to day life nowadays? What's your relief valve that gets you through, uh, with all of the craziness in your life? Um, I go in my car and I play Taylor Swift like really loud <laughs> and I just scream <laughs> Yeah. That, that's that's good. I, I have a yeah. convertible, so the <laughs> yelling really loud and screaming part can get me into trouble, but um, I can totally dig that. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what are you looking forward to most uh, over the next six months and, and maybe even when the world opens up again? Well, if it's, you know, if it's the next six months, I think we're all going to kind of be staying inside. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to... Uh, you know, just kind of being able to be around my family a little bit more. Um, I feel uh, really sad that I missed out on a lot of things for the past three years, even though I was able to come back for breaks and for summer and spring break and such. Um, I I always felt really sad and sorry to them that I couldn't always be around when they needed me to be. And very quickly after re kind of becoming disenchanted with uh, the university that I was attending, it was sort of like, I'm going here so I can get my piece of paper. I'm doing this because I have to do it. And if I don't do it, then I, you know, I'm dropped out of school. I have no nowhere to go. So I'm doing this because I have to get the piece of paper and I'm not doing it for any other reason. Mm -hmm. It's not enjoyment at this point. It's just because I need to get a degree so I can get on with my life. Um, and it was really sad to not be around um, and be with my friends and be with people. And I think I lost a lot of friendships because I just wasn't there to, you know, keep them open and keep them up. I, yeah, I, I'm happy to just be here and be in Redondo finally. Okay. 
just for a little bit of time to be around people. Um, and then if we ever get to the point where we, you know, open up and we can go out and have life, you know, semi normal to what it was yeah. before everything. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go to a concert. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hear that. Yeah. You know, the, the real friends are there no matter where you are. I, you know, yeah. they, they, they carry through. So, um, you, you'll know, you'll know who they are and they'll be there for you. It doesn't matter if you're on the other side of the world, the other side of the country or just up the street. So, and I miss going to the movies yeah. and, and even with the idea of movie theaters opening up again, I, I won't go to a movie theater until, you know, well after herd immunity's kicked in again, cause, um, yeah. I just don't think it's going to be all that comfortable an experience to be sitting in the big dark room with even only 25% of people you don't have any idea about. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's the thing where I think of like, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could go to the movies again or if we could like go to the beach again? Um, but then now that it's open, I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't seem too good. Yeah. And so, you know, the idea of it's, it's going to be an adjustment when real life sort of returns to something again to, to figure out what's good and what's bad and how, you know, what should I be doing to protect myself? So I completely feel what you're talking about. Um, we're all going to have an interesting adjustment, uh, when things start to straighten out again. Yeah, absolutely. So is there anything I can plug for you while we're talking? I mean, with a little luck, people are going to listen to this <laughs> and, um, yeah. and what would you like to share with them? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I have anything actually to plug because I'm kind of just, you know, out here doing myself. Um, if y'all ever need a freelance interpreter or translator for Japanese into English, we, Nina, we, we, we will post. <laughs> we will post it in a way so that they, they will know where to find you. Oh, LinkedIn. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Um, well, I'll, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. This was it was fascinating to learn about things. You know, you you're you you do things that I know nothing about. So learning about what you do uh, and all has been really amazing. So thanks for your time. Oh, thank you so much. I had such a good time. Bye.